welcome to the last uh, lecture of uh, the X Math workshop. Uh, and let's thank Oliver for organizing this. And uh, thank you for uh, showing up for the talk after such an exhausting couple of weeks. Uh, so, so first, let me just correct a couple of errors. Um, so the first uh, is uh, the A polynomial is well defined. It's an up to const, up to multiplication by non-zero const. So well defined uh, by and not by powers of M and L as I said yesterday. Um, the second is, uh, I said for all torus knots I give you the A polynomial that is not correct, uh, that result is only for torus knots of the form 2, 2p plus 1. And so, um, torus knots then. Value. 
But if you just change the bases, your eigenvalues will shift to one upon n, one upon a. Uh, uh, and so this, if this point belongs on the variety, this point also belongs on the variety. So that is why you get the symmetry. This follows from the fact that uh, you can always switch the meridian because uh, for a north complement, you have a representation to Z2 which takes the meridian to negative 1. So you can always, always replace your eigenvalue M by minus M. So M and minus M are both on the variety. So hence the equation has to be uh, even uh, 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 invariant under uh, plus or minus n, changing m to minus n. Uh, let me give you a couple more properties and then I'll go to the next topic. Um, uh, if you if you uh, take a connect sum of knots, um, uh, then this is divisible by by the a polynomial of k1 times the a polynomial of k2, but then the reducible representations are counted twice. But there may be more factors. Um, and uh, if you put m is equal to 1, then um, the eigenvalue, so then you are getting a parabolic representation and so then your eigenvalue of the of the longitude, that is also going to be parabolic and so then your eigenvalue is also going to be uh, plus or minus 1. Uh, and, but you can get this, this can, you can have many factors of uh, plus 1 or minus 1. And it's not really, not much is known about alpha, beta, and gamma. So, uh, so we know when, when your m is equal to 1, we kind of know that the representations, uh, so the eigenvalue is 1, so then the corresponding representations are parabolic. So what happens if your l is equal to 1? And so I'm going to just spend some time for a not complement K to describe what is the polynomial A M1. And this is related to the Alexander polynomial. So I just want to spend some time telling you what this is. So related to Alexander polynomial. So um, so to describe the relation to the Alexander polynomial, we um, we describe uh, meta abelian representations of the knot group into or, or representations of the knot group into the group of, of affine transformations of C. So representations of uh, group affine of C, which is A Z plus B, um, which is a translation and a dilation where A belongs to C star and here B belongs to C. Now let me just note a bit. Let, let me just tell you what the relationship is. Um, so suppose we have G0, G1 up to Gn to be meridian generator. So you look, you are looking at a vertical representation of the knot group. So meridian generators. And let this be a representation. Um, and this go to a z plus x i. So can someone tell me why um, the dilation factor is the same for all GIs? <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? 
No, no, you answer all the time. No, no. Yes, all the melanin generators are conjugate. And so, if you look look here, uh, if, if, you, if you just if you just conjugate this element, you will see that the the dilation factor does not change. Yeah. So so that is why this is unaffected, and and this is uh, which is xi. And now uh, we have um, we have the relations for every um, not. Uh, for the wording of presentation, so uh, and if you do the computation, what you what you will get is you will get. Uh, oh, I should just I should write. Let me write this as T, and you'll see in a moment why why I'm writing it as T. So you get. P of x i plus x j. If you just if you just now actually do the, you put it through the representation, and you'll get an equation uh, in x i and x j. Then the, the equation is the following. And so you get. And so, this is an equation for every crossing. So you get an equation like this for every crossing. Uh, and if you if, if you if you see, you are, you are going to have n generators and as many relate relators. We of course, when you write down the vertical representation, we throw out one of the relators because it is. Uh, uh, because it, you can obtain it from the remaining ones, but if you if you just uh, 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 write down, if you don't throw out the extra relator and write down uh, 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 the equation coming from each relator, what you get is we get um, we get uh, uh, n equations in n unknowns and coefficients. Coefficients of, uh, uh, are polynomials in T. Actually, just T or one minus T. Coefficients are, are in and so now. Did you say that you throw out one of the? No, no. Do not throw out one of the relations. Write an equation for every relation. For write an equation for every crossing. Oh, keep all of them. Keep all of them. Yeah, yeah. For every crossing. So you yeah. get n. Yeah, so you n get n equations for n unknowns. N plus one, I mean with g zero. G ah, uh, uh, when you normally throw out one, of the, yeah. Normally, one of the uh, gener, one of the generators is zero, and then one of the you can assume x zero. X zero is zero. You can assume x zero. Yeah, you can do that with conjugation. That that's right. That's right. So so good good point. So you can assume. Ah. So, what is the point of these equations? Well, you can only find a representation if these relations are satisfied. And what does it mean to say that the relations are satisfied? It means that we are able to find xi's and and t which satisfy the system. That is, you have you have now a matrix of coefficients which are polynomials in t, right? So you have you have this matrix of coefficients. So you have a matrix of coefficients um, a i j, and then you have x one up to x n. Then this is equal to zero, and you can you have a so solution. Uh, you have a representation if and only if you can find these numbers x i. That would mean that this matrix has to be singular. That is, the determinant of this matrix is zero. Right. So so, you want to look at the determinant of this matrix, which is some polynomial. And this polynomial happens to be uh, the Alexander polynomial. 
this is the theorem by Pira. Yeah, it's also it's also due to Berta. They they seem to have done it kind of roughly at the same time. Oh, really? Yeah. Have you maybe it was Berta, Berta, Berta did more with it though. Buddha. Really Sorry, Ali. Okay. Buddha. <laughs> Should I put a question on? <laughs> Century. Um, <laughs> Should I put a question mark? Put a question mark. Are we sure? Let me almost think it's in Graham's thesis. We wrote a paper on Alexander Paul. Well, maybe it appears in that paper. That's okay. Is that that Iran from Iran from Oh. So, um, so now, if you take a root of the Alexander polynomial, then the system will have a solution, and hence we are going to get a, a, a representation like that. And also, every root of the of, of, of Alexander polynomial will give you all the x, y, and so on. So basically, the roots of Alexander polynomials correspond to uh, a fine of representations. So now that you have been doing a lot of uh, representations and a little polynomial, this is a nice, uh, uh, these are more representations. Uh, uh, you should try to compute the twisted Alexander polynomial for these meta Willem representations and see what you get. Uh, the, the, it's something which is determined by the Alexander polynomial and the particular root which you get. But you can you can look at you can play around with the, you have a representation and you can play around with the twisted Alexander representation for twisted Alexander polynomial for this representation. So now how does the what has this to do with the A polynomial? Any questions? Okay, so now let us look at affine of C. So this is the group A Z plus B. And this is a Mobius transformation. So because this is a Mobius transformation, this sits inside PSL2 of C. And how does this sit inside? You want to see this as a matrix, as a 2 cross 2 PSL2 C matrix. So AZ plus B goes to square root of A, B divided by square root of A, 0, and 1 upon square root of A. Why do we scale by this? With plus or minus 1. Why is the square root of A popping up everywhere? Uh, so why is the square root of A? Yes, uh, so, uh, uh, so, so if you look at the PSL2C identification with the group of Mobius transformations of C, the way it does is if you have plus minus A, B, C, D, then this goes to the Mobius transform, Z going to A, Z plus B divided by C, Z plus D. Right. Um, and that's the reason uh, why if you want it to be AZ plus B just, and if you want it to write it in this form, you have to write it as a square root of a coming. And that's exactly the reason why you need a plus or minus one, because it means square root. So it's a, just sits inside very nice when PSL is Questions? And so you have this an SL to C, and there is your representation uh, rho. Uh, and so if you have this representation, then you can lift this representation to SL to C. Uh, uh, if you are a, if you if you if you are a not. And if you have a representation in PSL to C, you can always lift any representation to SL to C uh, simply because you are choosing a sign. And at every crossing, when you pass over every crossing, you can make sure that the sign 
the signs work out and when you come back eventually you will see that the last sign is determined. So, 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 you, so there is no issue lifting PSL2C representations to SL2C when you are a knot because you can just do it on any knot diagram. So, so now you see now we are getting SL2C representations and these are going to be reducible SL2C representations but non-abelian reducible SL2C representations in general. Yeah, because these matrices are normally coming uh, when B is non-zero. So, uh, and now let's look at what the eigenvalue is. So now you have all of these are meridians, right? And and um, okay, so um, so if you if you look at this group, well, the the the, the longitude in this representation goes to the identity. Uh, that is because there is there's many reasons you have um, if, you, if you look at AZ plus B if, if you look at the commutator subgroup uh, second commutator subgroup this is not this is not abelian but then if you look at one more of that if you look at the second commutator subgroup of this that vanishes so that is it's a meta abelian group so now so when you when you go over here the second commutator of the image is also going to vanish and hence the longitude is always going to go to identity. So that would mean that your eigenvalue of the longitude is going to be equal to 1. And now what happens to the uh, eigenvalue of the meridian? Look at this, it's square root of a. So the eigenvalue of the meridian, say, if it is equal to t, then this implies that delta k of t squared is going to be equal to 0. Right? That's exactly how we are doing. Your roots of the Alexander polynomial are corresponding to affine representations. So if you have affine rep representations, this dilation factor this is going to be uh, a root of the Alexander polynomial and the square root of that is exactly the minimum. So now what we have from all this is the proposition that Let V contained in uh, this is the, a, the the curve of the a polynomial be a component component distinct from L is equal to one. Then the intersection of L then uh, intersection. of V with the set L equal to 1 corresponds to roots of roots of the Alexander polynomial more precisely that is less precisely M1 and delta K of M squared so have common factor, common factor corresponding to this intersections. Let's tell you what is the issue with being equal to these intersections. To our problem. Uh, the issue with then being equal is repeated roots. Right? Here, when you are doing the intersection here, you are not really taking the multiplicity or, or it's not really known if what happens if you take the multiplicity into our account. And so that's why you only get a common factor which when you take where you, you don't really look at roots uh, if, if the, the roots are repeated or not. It would be very interesting to look at this intersection in the sense of algebra geometry, taking into account the multi multiplicities and to see whether you actually get the full Alexander polynomial or not. This is not known. It would be really very nice if you could get the full Alexander polynomial, meaning with the multiplicities, actually, if the multiplicity agrees. It's not known. From the polynomial, of course, you cannot tell. But from here, 
you, you, if you, if you look at, look at more algebraic geometry, you have, you have explicit equations. So you find out an Alexander polynomial which has a repeated root. Yeah, you look at the explicit equation of the A polynomial, you look at a component, you look, you intersect that, and then you study the, the multiplicity of the roots. It's a very, you can do very concrete examples here. And it will be a very nice result to say that actually you are getting, you, you are able to control the multiplicity. No one knows what happened. Okay, so, uh, And I promise uh, some geometry in this, uh, in the third talk. So let me give you a geometric way of computing the A polynomial, or slight variation of the A polynomial. So, um, so now let us uh, restrict ourselves to um, one cusp hyperbolic manifolds or a hyperbolic knots. By hyperbolic, I mean uh, I mean uh, a complete finite volume hyperbolic or uh, hyperbolic knots. And note that the isometric group, the positive, uh, the orientation preserving isometries. Uh, of H3 are isomorphic to PSL to C. So, if you look at the representations in PSL to C, as you have already seen that there is there is lots of uh, connection to geometry uh, uh, because coming from deformations of hyperbolic structures. But but still, we do not consider PSL to character varieties of PSL to uh, uh, A polynomials. We are only looking at SL, and the the reason to look at SL is Simply, as I said, that uh, uh, the 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 bar set its theory for uh, 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 for 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 uh, splitting of SL2 was developed for SL2 and not for PSL. So the very similar to the SL2 construction, we can we can also define PSL to C character varieties, representation varieties, and character varieties. Uh, character varieties <coughs> and the PSL to C A polynomial. Now, what happens is that uh, in general, to work with these objects, one needs to be careful because SL to C very nicely sits inside. Uh, it is an algebraic subset of C to the power four. Right? It's just the only uh, the equation is the determinant equation. But PSL is just slightly tricky, so you need to go up. Uh, dimension a little bit to in order to do the analysis there. but 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 the, uh, all the algebraic geometry works out and you can you can get exactly similar results where ideal points corresponds to essential surfaces and and everything and this is this part is really developed very well and they can they can do more more finer things this is developed by Boyer and Jack um, so, so, so when you are considering the PSL to C A polynomial, just, just a, 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 a quick thought. You, you see that the eigenvalue is only defined up to sign plus or minus. So you need to take the square of the eigenvalues. So instead of taking the eigenvalues, you just for, for the PSL to C polynomial, you just need to take the square of the eigenvalues. Eigenvalues of PSL to C. And so now there's a geometric way to obtain the PSL to C A polynomial. Okay, so um, So 
So, so we have a hyperbolic three manifold, and we have an ideal triangulation. This is an ideal. which we have seen lots of in the two or three weeks ago. And what does, a, what does an ideal triangulation do for you? Well, any ideal triangle, uh, any ideal tetrahedron is described um, by a complex parameter and um, There's a complex parameter uh, which is associated to its edge, and there are three of them. Uh, 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 there is one associated to every edge, and they they, they are related uh, in the following way. I'm going to redraw the picture which I have seen many times. And the, the opposite edges have the same uh, same one. Although it's so this is a this is your ideal tetrahedron, uh, which is this is sitting inside concretely sitting inside H three, uh, and its vertices are at infinity, and it has finite volume and so on. So now. Uh, we we have uh, two sets of equations. So so first of all, um, if you have n uh, ideal tetrahedra, then you will have n edges in the in the final gluing because of Euler characteristic argument. So so the number of edges um, uh, for this triangulation is also going to be equal to n. And so what happens is we can set up these gluing equations. Um, I think all the equations were referred to as gluing equations, but I um, usually just separate uh, them into two. There are the gluing equations and there are the completeness equations. Because one of the completeness equations tell you information about the complete the completeness of the uh, manifold as a geometric uh, manifold, and the gluing equations uh, just just tell you about about just the geometric structure in the interior and not at the cusp. So so what are what's the gluing equation? If you look at an edge, um, then this edge has uh, uh, has many ideal tetrahedra glued to it. And and so I'm going to just try to draw a rough picture. And there there are they're all all coming in, and each of them is contributing a parameter. But if you go around this edge, uh, this structure th this has to be a neighborhood in H3, and so then the angle and the and these parameters have to multiply up. So basically. Uh, the the edge parameters edge parameters have to multiply to one. One around that. And this gives you a, a a hyperbolic structure, but in general, this hyperbolic structure is incomplete. So, what this gives is this gives us n equations, so n equations, uh, so each which looks looks like um, z i to the power Uh, the reason it looks like this is if you if you just notice uh, the the edge parameters which are contributed by every edge they are either z 
are, are products of Zn1 minus Z. And so then it may happen that uh, uh, that one tetrahedron, uh, one tetrahedron contributes more than one edge to a to an edge in the matrix. So so hence you can have you, you can have more exponents. Um, and uh, the the zi corresponds to no that is a the the zj corresponds to this parameter. So I'm going to just going to call these star. And what happens is um, you are at the cusp, and this structure gives you uh, a representation of the cusp torus of, of the fundamental group of the cusp torus in into PSL to C. And so then, um, so here. Let, let me just write, write this. <coughs> this gives you, so this gives, um, and if you look at uh, the, rep the representation of M, and suppose say this is say A, B, um, you can always conjugate so that this is always upper triangular. Um, and Rho of L is similar. What happens is this number over here can be obtained exactly like like this. So there's an equation which is giving you this number. So so there is a and that is the completeness equation. So what is the completeness equation? There is a there is an equation exactly like this, which can be read off completely from the component of this of the triangulation, which is giving you this uh, uh, this dilation factor of this eigenvalue. Uh, the, I think no, I should. Uh, it's it's the square of the eigenvalue which you're getting. But here, let me just write this up. Um, so you have. M i j prime. So they have, they have the same form. This is equal to so a square. And suppose your uh, I've already used b. And you similarly get another equation. There is uh, there is no i really. No. There is another index which is of cusp, but we are only in one cusp. So so uh, th these numbers only depend upon j, and this is b squared. So basically, you get two equations coming for, 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 from 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 the completeness condition. Well, what is the completeness condition? The completeness is that the manifold is complete if this is a parabolic representation. Otherwise, it's a hyperbolic representation, and uh, the 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 cus torus will get a similarity structure, which and if, if you need completeness, you need to have Euclidean structure. By Euclidean, it means that the cus torus uh, uh, fundamental group should be pre, should be represented into isometries of R two because that's uh, an isometries of R two are just translations. No dilation is allowed. So so if you need if you if you need uh, um, and. So what happens is, if this is equal to plus or minus one, then we get get completeness. But if you if you if you ignore these equations, then you you have actually uh, uh, a lot of hyperbolic structures which are not complete. So now, can, can I ask some yes. things about your notation? You have r and primes and I mean. Uh, does it matter what these things are? Are you? These are just the integers. These are these are integers. I mean, are your your primes are just because they're different? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. The, the primes are just denoting what goes on z j and what goes on one minus z j. I'm just trying to follow standard notation. This is all very well explained in Neumann and Zandi. 
and many many books of that. Uh, if you want a good reference for this, this is also in person, it's not but not in this way. The setup I'm following is from other side. So that's why I have this specific notation. Usually if you have more cuts, there is a K over here which is denoting the cuts, but we only have one cut, so not worry about it. So, so you get you get completeness if this is equal to plus or minus one. But in general, you have an algebraic set um, such that star is equal to uh, 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 which, which satisfies the star. So, so zi satisfies star. Um, uh, if you if you just think about it for a minute, these are that that there is a slight uh, issue in defining it uh, right this way because uh, you can have negative exponents, and so you are going to get denominators. But what you do is you clear the denominators over here and make it polynomial and take that system of equations. That is a very crude way of doing it, and you are losing information. If you are unlucky, you can lose lose whole components off to infinity. Then you do that. Because you are not allowing this to be zero. Uh, a fancier way of doing that is you increase the number of, uh, you increase the dimension threefold, and instead of writing z like this, you actually write z, z prime, and z double prime, and and so then you you encode all the equations in these variables with the condition that uh, all three of them multiply to be equal to one. Uh, Minus one. So then you have one more equation, and so then you are able to get a, a more complete sort of set. So, so that said, the way I'm defining, you can get a more complete model of it, more smoother and more poly algebraic model of it by doing this. Stuff. But I'm not bothered now. Yes. You get uh, n Globe equations, you get completeness equations in a pair for each cusp. Right now, we're only dealing with. Oh uh, yeah, but they are they are a pair for each each cusp or a squared and b squared. But if the completeness equations are when they are equal to plus or minus one, but if the meridian is equal to plus or minus one, then the longitude has to be equal to plus or minus so one. It's just one equation. So you get only one equation per cusp. Yeah, and the and the gluing equations are actually dependent. So this is actually you only need n minus one instead of n. So uh, uh, so that brings us to a point. We 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 I, I mentioned that there is a component of the character variety x naught which has dimension one if m is one if but the boundary of m is a torus and m is hyperbolic, right? And the reason for that is precisely this that you have n minus one independent equations here. And now when you add one more equation to give you complete structure, then what are the solutions out of this? By Moscow rigidity, there's only one complete hyperbolic structure on any manifold. That means that when you take n minus one equations and one equation, n equation, you get a discrete set. So that is if you just forget this, then your n minus one equations is going to give you something of dimension one. Because adding one equation gives you dimension zero. So, so if you just have these equations, n, n minus 1, you are going to get something of dimension 1. And now if you look at uh, near a point, which is, which, uh, if, you, if you take a point which gives you the complete structure, and if you take near around that, you can show that uh, uh, that point in this solution set is smooth. And the, and the parameterization is precisely given by these log of uh, log of meridian log of the the, the, the logs of these these numbers so near the complete structure that gives you a very a smooth parameterization so now you explicitly have you have this algebraic set and you have you have a parameterization right from uh, uh, around the neighborhood of this point and this set you can you can relate to psl2 representations and you can lift that up to sl2c representations so what you what you are get, eventually getting is uh, at one point in the SL2 representation variety on this component, you are getting smoothness. And for algebraic geometry reasons, it is enough if you can show something about infinitely many points in an algebraic set. You can you can conclude that for everything. So that's the way you get the fact that x this component x naught has dimension one. That's this is the way you prove that. So now 
uh, what am I going to do? Uh, well, we will define a map called H, called the holonomy map, which gives you uh, the square of the meridian and the square of the longitude, this A squared and B squared. So I'm going to give you M squared and L squared. And now, L and M. I'm asking of the squares. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. I, 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 I'll just call them M and L, but they are actually uh, the squares of the eigenvalues. Yeah, so this is the eigenvalue, and this M and L are exactly these numbers. So these are precise, precise A squared and B squared coming from the completeness. And so now, what you do is, you do the same thing as you do um, uh, for the A polynomial, you take the union of all components V such that, uh, um, such that H of V, uh, the dimension of H of V is equal to 1. Right? So now you, you consider, the, so, so V is a component and V is a component of this algebra And so now, you look at the equation of this curve. You call H of, and you let H of ML to be equal to the defining equation of CM. So exactly the same thing. You have precisely like the polynomial. You, you have a curve and now you still the defining equation. So then the theorem is that um, this guy uh, divides the PSL to CA polynomial. Divides the PSL to CA polynomial. Um, what is the issue with it being equal? The issue is that uh, these triangulations. Th this is all depending on a triangulation. So what may happen is if you if you start from a really nasty triangulation, uh, you may in, in this case in P of M. There may be components of the character variety which actually you do not get from the triangulation. So, so that is the reason why it may not be completely equal to the polynomial. And there is a there is a canonical factor. Uh, the if the bars denote the PSL. So what is H naught? Wherever there is a naught in all these uh, 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 theories, what it usually means is that. Uh, it corresponds to the complete faithful representation. So as I said, there's a complete faithful representation, and the uh, and and uh, uh, and the, the the corresponding component uh, and the equation uh, is denoted by a naught. And the there are there are uh, uh, the tetrahedral parameters which correspond to the complete structure when you're solving the gluing and the completeness equations. And so then there is a there is a there's a uh, uh, there's a component in P of M which contains this point which gives you the complete tetrahedral parameter. And so then there's a corresponding component here. So these two are canonical components with, uh, of both the varieties, and they are actually equal. Um, and the, and the let me just say one word about the proof of this. Well. Let me say four arrows about the proof of this. The four arrows are that uh, from any triangulation you can construct what is called a developing map. This developing map gives you uh, a representation into the isometric group of H3. So this gives you. So what is the developing map? Just to think about very is in the most easiest example, if you take a torus and if you form the torus with explicit triangles, you cut out triangles from the paper, you match edges of the triangle and now you 
glue them together and you and you have a torus like that so what you can do is you cut back to your triangles and take similar copies of the triangles and start putting them together and get all of r2 and when you do that you can see uh, where your initial triangles are actually being rotated or, or, or much easier if you take a cycle on your torus you can see how this cycle is acting on this on this huge wallpaper which you have created so what you in short what you are getting in for every generator of the fundamental group you are getting an explicit uh, 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 isometry of r2 because you have you have explicit tiling of r2 and you can see how it well, typically it will just it will just translate, but you have the actual shapes in which it will translate. So you can you can see that. So that is exactly what is going on over here. You have a triangulation, and from the triangulation, you you are basically putting together all of H3, and then you are studying how this triangulation is moving about. And that's going to give you a representation. So that's how I I, I said PSL to see the PSL to see character. Model. So what this is, this is the PSL to see character variety. And um, from here, exactly as, as for the SL polynomial, you have the A polynomial, the restriction where the A polynomial lives. And from here, you have C cross C, and you have the holonomy map. And this is precisely the analog of your T delta map. Right. This is, if you forget the bars, you have this picture for the A polynomial bar. Right. And the bars are basically the picture for the PSL. So yeah, the only way, to, the way to go from SL to PSL is just put bars on all the coming, all the diagrams. And the point is that this diagram comments. And that's how you get the first step. Um, Okay, so what is the point of asking another question? Yes, of course. Again, we're dealing with one cusp, and yeah, if raising cusps raise, is it a PSL two n c? No, no. You mean if you have more cusps? Yeah. Well, if you have more cusps, you don't have an a polynomial. You have a polynomial for every. I mean, then the cusp group is not any more z to okay. z. So it, it's not. I shouldn't be looking for the generalization. Not there were always just there are generalizations to something called the eigenvalue variety, uh, which is very analogous to the A polynomial variety, but there is no sort of reasonable computations or not. You can't really, work. I mean, you can't do anything. <coughs> you, you said one cusp at the beginning, and I just thought it, it was is, like it a is small it, case. But no, 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 you need <laughs> it to be one cusp because if you have more cusps, uh, uh, you don't really get a polynomial. The issue is really that. You will get a string of polynomials, you get a variety in a very large space, and you get many polynomials for this. But the problem is it's not known whether this variety is a complete intersection. So meaning that whether these polynomials completely define or there are more polynomials. See, in the case here, if you have an irreducible component, you have one polynomial which is on which the variety vanishes. So you have a canonical uh, generator of the ideas. But in the case of more dimensions, you do not have that. So if you get, if, if you find some set of polynomials, how do you know this? There is no other set of polynomials. So there is no. You can't really associate like a system of polynomials. Yeah. So that makes yeah. a lot more sense. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. Any any, any questions? Uh, let me just tell you the, what the connection between the PSL and SL polynomial is. Say for not complements where every PSL representation lives to an SL representation. Uh, 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 for not complements, uh, uh, since so so if you, if, if you just think about this polynomial, what is going on is the the PSL A polynomial is giving you a squares of eigenvalues. So so now um, so this 
Let me just write this and just figure this out. Um, I think that's the definition. This is the PSLA polynomial for a knot, and this is the SLA polynomial for a knot. Yeah. This is because the eigenvalues are getting square. Uh, and as for the naught, you see m and minus m is the same, it's even in m, so that's why it doesn't look like. And I just want to say one last thing about the a polynomial, uh, which is the volume form. Um, and I, I'm just going to do it in this setting and because of this relation or because of how the uh, uh, PSL and SLA polynomial varieties kind of interact with each other, you can lift the same thing to, to SL. So it's really enough to do it for PSL. And so, so what happens is we have um, uh, if you look at a I, if you look at an ideal tetrahedron, it has a volume. This volume is given by a very nice function, which a lot of you saw uh, uh, the, at Columbia. This is called a block wigner dialog of it. algebraic set up uh, to describe volumes and, and uh, on which this function is just like a homomorphism. So, uh, so in short what I'm saying is if you have an object like a hyperbolic 3 manifold, we really don't need to be one cusp anymore, we don't even need to be cusp, we can be compact or cusp hyperbolic 3 manifold which is made up of uh, uh, of a union of ideal tetrahedron, uh, which is a union of ideal tetrahedron, then the volume actually can be just seen as a sum of the volumes of uh, the respective tetrahedra and hence so the, the values of the dialogue editor. Now what happens is for uh, you have a form curve over here. Yeah. At every point you have 
every point is an I, I is some eigenvalue of some representations. This representation you can think of as coming from the triangulations. So the, the map here which I have constructed, uh, well, which, which I just described to you, uh, also goes back the reverse way. Uh, this is a, in general a two is two to one map. But if you are given a representation with with reasonably good properties, uh, well, the property is that the peripheral subgroup shouldn't have shouldn't be z two plus z two. Uh, so as long as you can find as long as you can find a fixed point of the peripheral subgroup over here, which is a completely algebraic condition, you can pull back this re representation to a triangulation. So think of it as, again coming back to our Toro's example, if you are given some sort of a representation, if you are given how your meridian moves about things and your, how your longitude moves about things, you can actually plot points, you can take a meridian and actually see where it goes and actually cut out a, cut out two triangles or cut out a fundamental domain and you with some blue line. So you can, once you have a fundamental domain, you can actually write the volume of it. So that's exactly what the map is, you are, you are cutting out a fundamental domain. So, there is a volume for a representation and um, so you have your M L and if you, if you take some curve um, going to some other point uh, and if you, if you take the integral of this form on this curve, say, say M L and M prime L prime, you actually get the difference of the volumes at the two representations. That is what that is what this means. Let me just take the integral of this form along this curve. Very explicitly, this is what happens. There is a there is a more algebraic setup which you can describe all this is. And and this so so the exactness of the volume form which is which is this result uh, uh, has many proofs in the literature. The Neumann and Zeiger in their paper proved this uh, more analytically. Uh, Craig Hodgson proved this in his thesis, but the A polynomial was not really there that that time. Well, it came after a couple of years after that. And uh, in the A polynomial, in the A polynomial, where they mention how how this happens and exactly. And in my thesis, I gave a k-theoretic proof of this. Uh, using some more algebra. Um, uh, so this is, uh, and let, for, for, for those who have attended the workshop at Columbia and attended uh, uh, for Fernando Rodriguez Villegas' talk, this was really the key ingredient in his computations of Mahler measure. I mean, unfortunately, we should have, it was just unfortunate we scheduled him so early on. If we had scheduled him, say, maybe, in the in the second week, people would have gotten more out of it because he was using a lot of ideas which 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 were which came up later on. But but he was using this idea a lot, and this form actually comes up in algebraic geometry all the time. This is the regulator for this for the polynomial curve, and uh, and there's a very nice algebraic setup. And so so what happens is that the the, the a polynomial somehow. I, I, are very good. The, the A polynomials are very good examples to compute this two variable Mahler measure. And there is a there are lots of people have been working on this and how, how to but, but initially when it started out, it it was really not clear why why the A polynomial is coming up. And this is this whole K theory behind it which makes it all possible. So let me just end. I think do I have a minute? Oh, I'm going to say I've gone five minutes. So I'll, I'll stop. Thanks. Any questions? Uh, if, if anyone is interested, I can, in, in, the, in 10 minutes or 5 minutes, I can show you some examples of how to compute a polynomial. But I don't want people to, I don't want force people to stay back. If, they, if you want to leave, you can. But if you are interested, I can just uh, put up on the US and show some examples. It's very similar to the, okay. the background for the algorithm for the computation. It's exactly the same thing. I'll just I'll just write out.
the two, two lines before I But then how do you know that you got all the dimension one you got on it? I guess that's the... Oh, oh, you know because you, I mean, you're doing uh, elimination theory. They're exactly like you did for character work. Uh, but, but are there any questions? Okay.